Welcome to Make Possible Bite Size, a weekly podcast brought to you by Permutive, championing change in publishing, advertising and beyond. Each episode, we chat to an inspiring guest about their careers, their lives and how they're making change possible. Let's bite right in. Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra Bannerman, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Permutive. Welcome to a special edition of Make Possible Bite Size. In celebration of Black History Month, we are shining a light on inspiring black professionals and asking thought-provoking questions about their journeys to success and how they've made it all possible. Today on the show, I'm joined by a very special guest, actor, writer, and director, O.T. Fag Bainley. Hi, O.T. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. How are you doing? Best and highly favoured. I'm just giving thanks. (laughs) Aren't we all? Um, it's really, really great to have you here. Um, should we jump into some questions? Yeah, please. Great. Uh, lots of people will, of course, recognise you from your performances and shows like The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, and I'm really personally excited for your upcoming role in Marvel's Black Widow, Marvel fan over here. Um, but you're also known for developing your own um, successful projects like your recent sitcom Max. So my first make possible question for you is, what is it that keeps driving you to keep achieving and keep challenging yourself? Mm, I mean, look, I think there might be a part of it which is innate, like I'm kind of like a doer type person. Um, but I think there, there are times where I, you can get off track and feel unmotivated. I remember when I was creating my TV show at some point, it was getting so difficult to get through a lot of the bureaucracy of it. and. And just the the act of writing, I find very challenging. And so I kind of had to get back down to this idea of what was really important to me. Um, there's this kind of Nietzsche quote that a man can bear with any uh, how to live if he has a strong enough why. And the idea that there's another a favorite book of mine, Man's Search for Meaning, that the, the idea is that if you can kind of find purpose to struggle and challenge, then then it's all capable. So what, one of the things I, I try and think about is what is the greater purpose and meaning to the work that I'm doing? What is the social, cultural, political, philosophical influence that I want to have on the world? And that I find quite a motivating uh, you know, northern, northern star for me. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. There's an awful lot to, um, to care about in the world right now. Mm. Lots of interesting things going on. Um, if we uh, keep it um, close to the theme... Are there any black historical figures that inspire you? And if so, why? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. In fact, you, you, you put this to me in the, in the, in the pre-chat. What it, I should have really kind of thought about <laughs> who that, that one person is. I mean, look, to, to, to be really honest, the, the black people, the people who I find most inspiring are those who are closest to me. My, my big sister, for example, is an award-winning teacher, and right now she kind of designs the exams for health and social care for the country of Great Britain. She's an amazing mother. She manages all those things with, with humor and intelligence and compassion and fire. And and again, my, my big brother, Eddie, again. So, so I, I think very often when I look for people who inspire me, it's, I, I look for people around me first. I think it's it's really good to have kind of like to know that you know all our gods have play feet that we're all that they're all human beings and and to kind of have those role models is like okay well that's actually how you do it it's not just this glossy wikipedia version of it um that being said i, I recently started developing a, a project about little known uh, black history and uh you know and we we look at various historical figures from like mansa musa who was the uh, emperor, the leader of the Songhai Empire, one of the ri- probably the richest man of all time, depending on how you calculate money, um, billions of thousands, hundreds of billions of, of dollars worth of, of wealth, and he brought you know some of the first libraries and, and educational institutions. It was kind of like he got a fifty thousand person university within his city, and this is like 13th, 14th century. And then um, and then people like uh, Toussaint Louverture, who was the one of the leaders along with Dessalines of the Haitian Revolution, which was the the only successful slave revolt of all time, which defeated Napoleon and Pitt the Younger, and and was the first country in the America and the Caribbean to actually abolish slavery. Um, <clears throat> Those, those figures I find really fascinating uh, and intriguing as well. Yeah, that sounds really, really cool. What is it that made you start investigating that and start working on a project like that? Well, you know, I've always been interested in history. 
Um, it's a great history podcast called uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History for any of you history buffs out there. Um, and I, I'm just fascinated by all of it. But whenever I come across stuff where I'm like, well, why isn't this known? You know, so for example, take the Haitian Revolution, where you know the narrative seems to be that slavery was abolished when you know a bunch of really well-meaning white people got together and said, listen, we should really probably make an end to this and <clears throat> this is just yeah, every black history month they kind of bring them out and william wilberforce i guess is part of it please guys like, please stop but the actual story that that there was a a bunch of people who were formerly slaves who stood up and defeated the napoleon's fleet the biggest fleet he's ever sent anywhere was defeated by this the, these people in in haiti um and then they abolished, they created a, a constitution which abolished slavery. I'm like, why is that not part of the narrative of how slavery was abolished? Um, I think we can use our imaginations to figure out why. But uh, so, yeah, I just love sharing that kind of knowledge with people. So I'm, I'm trying to develop this series. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, OK, let's let's talk a little bit more about you. Um, when you were first starting out uh, as an actor, how conscious were you of industry attitudes towards race and diversity? And were there any related barriers that you're particularly proud to have overcome in that area? You know, uh, when I graduated drama school, right now, there's so many black British actors who are doing so well. Um, you know, there are five or six have been in Oscar contention in the last um, for five or six years. Um, when I graduated, there were none. There were no, I mean, with respect to Marianne Jean Baptiste, there were no real black British actors which were very well known on the Hollywood. Uh, stage and so I was kind of aware that there was that kind of glass ceiling um, even though you know Brit white British actors had had plenty of success in Hollywood as, up to that point um, but yeah there, there were there were lots of I think really the, the biggest kind of barriers or whatever that I tried to overcome was I would sometimes get offered scripts where I thought this was just perpetuating a stereotype that you know look a black person could be anybody, you know, from a prince to a, a mugger, but are you developing three-dimensional characters? And there are lots of times where I turned down auditions um, uh, because I just didn't think they were really representing. They weren't progressive in that way. And in one time where I didn't properly read the script before I accepted the job, um, I fought really hard in the once we got into production um, to make changes to the script, which were fundamentally successful, luckily, to you know my collaborators. Um, and so, yeah, I think most of the, the battles I think I've faced have been just more on like small, nuanced ways where you kind of resist the pull of, you know, subliminally racist attitudes. Yeah, um, I think that we have to kind of approach that kind of thing in lots of different industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that we all need to be conscious of all the time. And so that's yeah. the context. Um, so we are actually seeing uh, an increasingly diverse mix of people and stories in film and television. Uh, so it could be said that there has been some progress in the industry over the last couple of decades. But you've experienced it all from an acting and writing directing perspective, whereas, you know, I've only experienced it from a viewer's perspective where I see mm. different types of faces now. Um, what progress have you seen being made behind the scenes? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really challenging sometimes. Uh being able to have this tolerance for this ambiguity, this, 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 these contradictory things that on one side we're making progress and on the other side there's lots to do. And, um, and so we've definitely, I think, made progress in terms of giving opportunities, on-screen opportunities for uh, people of ethnic minorities. That hasn't translated to behind the camera. Um, the, the numbers are abysmal when it comes down to executives, executive producers, writers, directors, um, producers um and so you know i recently got the opportunity to write and direct uh on my own television show and it's it's kind of like the exception that pro proves the rule really and and to say that it also wasn't straightforward for me to to get the chance to direct on the show i had to really really fight for it and and kind of make it clear that i wasn't going to do it otherwise and um and so yeah it's really challenging to do that but ultimately you know you know Martin Luther said uh, the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends towards justice and I think with people putting in the requisite like effort and energy and us finding our allies and, and working with them like change is possible but there's so much work to be done yeah 
Um, why do you think that there is such disparity between in front of the camera and behind? Is it just because actors are, are visible um, and everything um, is not? I, I think people don't want to give up power as a general rule. And, um, and, and people, it's, it, it's work to kind of become aware of one's privilege. And that includes myself. Like I have certain privileges of, of whatever that, you know, I, I'm a middle-class person or that I am a man or that I'm, you know, that there are, I'm able-bodied, whatever. I've got a bunch of ways that, that society gives me a privilege over other people. And it's just, it's a lot of effort to look at it. And then, and at the end of the day, what's there for me to gain personally from it? Oh God, you know. So it's like, so this is why change is slow to come. Um, I guess they found out that diverse cast actually perform really well in the box office. Diverse cast really make money, and there's no bigger motivator in capitalism than money. Um, and 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 I think time will will show that the same applies behind the camera. Um, but it's yeah, I think the, the reason why that disparity is there is that the people behind the camera are very slow to do that, and that can be because of conscious racism or unconscious racism. Um, just to say real quick though, you know, I think oftentimes people become really <clears throat> obsessed with this idea that racism is about people who who like are like I hate black people. Oh my god, black people. You know, like I think. I think that's a mistake. I think the best way to think about racism is what are those actions and attitudes which um, perpetuate a state of being where black people are or people minorities are excluded. And so you don't have to consciously hate black people to be engaged in racist acts. Um, you don't even have to be a white. You can be a black person engaged in racist acts, like, like against yourself, um, against your own people. Like the question is like, what are, what are we doing to kind of battle that? tide which has perpetually creates these results of all white castes and if you're not acting against those ties then ultimately you're acting for them i think the, the i think conversations about this are very useful because I, I think oftentimes it's bringing to light i i i'm a person who tends to believe that people are, are fundamentally good or at least the majority of people are fundamentally good and and that you know, having a greater consciousness, awareness, and empathy for the experience of others will bring about action. And so, you know, I, I think the you know the first thing is having conversations and allowing people to become more aware. You know, not long ago, I was having a a conversation with a differently abled body the actor, and I became, and she was saying to me, "Look, every time I get a part, the storyline is about well, how I'm disabled and how that kind of." affects my life and, and she's like well there's so many more things going on in my life than that you know why does this have to be my storyline every time uh, another time I went to the movies and with a, a, um, an actress who was in her 50s and uh, she came out she's really upset with the movie and I thought like, what's the problem she was like look there we go again with this you know a male actor who's in his 50s his wife is like 30 their kid is like 16 it doesn't even make sense but we're, we're, we're perpetually kind of like not giving age appropriate partners to actors because of this kind of like, I, and so, and, and each time I was like, my mind like opened up to like, oh wow, that's just a whole thing I don't have to consider because I'm not a woman in my fifties and I'm not a disabled actor. So I think, I think conversation, understanding empathy, and then, you know, uh, getting together in groups, unionizing and mobilizing is, is the way. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty relevant. Um, a lot of our viewers and listeners today are in advertising and publishing, um, digital publishing. Uh, so it's it's another creative industry, arguably not as glamorous as film and TV, but another creative industry that can share some of the same challenges around diversity. So, um, you know, it, it's really interesting to hear that. But if you were to um, provide some advice to those people in industry as to what they can actively do, um what what might might it be right so so one of the things i'm always aware of you know is is when you employ people when you interview like how many people of color do you interview like take away like do we have to do we have to employ a black person do we have to tick box just put all that to one side how many people of color did you interview and 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 very often the answer is little to none and then the answer comes back well you know i couldn't find enough people uh, you know the, enough people didn't apply for the job um i couldn't find enough people who were qualified in the way i wanted them to be qualified and and i think you could really just interrogate 
those questions and go, okay, well, obviously, so the system is set up to give you certain results, which means a certain amount of white applicants. And if you're not getting enough black applicants, then maybe you need to change your system of finding applicants. And so, like, question that. And yes, unfortunately, it's going to take a bit of work, but that's how you change. And then the other thing is, is just, again, interrogating, like, how did you get your first shot? Were you entirely qualified for your first shot? What about that other friend of yours, you know, who who got that job before they had had all the experience in the world? Are we affording people from ethnic minorities and other, you know, uh, like access challenge groups? Are we affording them the same kind of opportunities where they're just starting out? And 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 when someone does start out, when a person of color does start out, are we going when they mess up? Do we go? Well, probably got the job because they were back. Like, uh, do, do we use that same mentality when a, a newcomer white person messes up? Do we go? Oh probably only got a job because they were white we don't so we're just challenging all those those systems that set up to give us those results and when we get results when we get new black people in are we thinking about them differently than we think about those white people who get their first chance you know and i think interrogating those and setting up systems which bring in more diversity i think would be a, a good way to start right you did um exactly that right when you were pushing for a diverse cast on your your own sitcom max yeah, and, and, and crew. Yeah. Um, and, and I've got to say, it's a lot of work. Like, it's, it was hard. Like, I come in just going, you know what we're going to do? We're going to bring out the best, you know, black DP and the best. And, and, and it's, it's, it's challenging because, because the systems, because the natural flow of things is to bring white middle class male candidates. That's, that's the way the system is naturally set up. So you go, oh, well, put out a casting notice or we ask oh yeah, who do you know who did you work with last and if you do it like that you will get the same result so yeah we had to we had to work really hard and and to 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 find and to give opportunities to really talented individuals and, and i hope when people watch the show one of the things that stands out to it is like the production values aren't like general uk comedy production values they're really high and that in part is because we gave opportunities to to people um from a diverse background who were desperate and hungry and talented um, and it really paid dividends. What impact do you think it made for them and to the project? Well I mean look our uh, make hair and makeup designer for example very talented uh, lady uh, ha had done hair and makeup before had never been the lead uh, hair and makeup person now she can go to her next job and she's been the lead hair and makeup person for a show. So that may help span on the rest of her career because now she's got that thing in her pocket that goes, hey, look, I did that. And so that's what I hope as much as possible to kind of like enable people to have more opportunities. Um, I mean, no, listen, my number one hope is that I make fucking sick shit that people love. And I happen to believe that one of the ways of doing that is by giving opportunities to new people. But, but as a secondary wonderful um benefit to that is that it can help spur on more opportunities for them yeah okay um it's been really really great talking to you um i've got one more question for you sure. and it, it's totally you focused so what in your career are you most proud of having made possible uh well i mean look creating writing directing producing my own TV show, you know, in collaboration with many other people. Um, that probably is the thing I'm most proud of. There, there, there's so few, few people in the world who've had the opportunity to do those three things on the television show. And, um, and, and because people like my, my brother, Luti Fagbeni and his production company, Luti Media, because of Channel 4 and, and, and supporters there and, and like a, whole casting crew of people I, I, I managed to kind of create something which started as a kernel in my mind and now as a television show which is coming out on channel 4 and, channel 4 and, um, and so yeah that, 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 that I guess and also in a way the in the a, a big part of the seed of that television show was like a tough time I was going through and the the ability to kind of take one's challenges and and find you know your lemonade stand out of that bag of lemons you know i think for me is one of the greatest things abilities one can have or if you're lucky enough to have it so so yeah i'd say that 
What a nice inspiring note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, yeah, great question. Cool. Um, all that remains uh, is for me to thank all the listeners and the viewers for tuning into this special edition of Make Possible Bite Size. Uh, we'll be back next week with another inspiring guest talking about what they do to champion change, think in exciting new ways and make a difference. Until then, bye-bye. Bye, OT. Bye, thanks.